Hi guys. Well, here we are back again. Chapter 9 of Peruvian Plunge. Where I have finally gotten myself into the Mother of God River. And this is another long chapter. Let me plow ahead. I'm going to put this little dog up because he seems to get in the way of my computer. So we're going to let the little dog go and uh, we're going to pick up chapter 9, Lodged in the Jungle at Last. All right, but speaking of the lodge, we're going to start out uh, from this qu quote from the Manu Wildlife Center website. <clears throat> The lodge at Manu Wildlife Center relies heavily on workers from the local Masha Gwenga and Piro indigenous communities and provides jobs and training that help better the standard of living in the local villages without prejudicing their ideal or idealistic lifestyle. We offer them choice and opportunity that prior to tourism did not exist. And there you go. And it is now May 30th, 2009 as I travel from Boko Manu to Manu Wildlife Center. <clears throat> During the night, the rain had alternated between steady drumming and torrential downpour. By the time I had dragged my soggy ass out of bed at 6.30 a.m. to meet my 8 a.m. boat, it had elected to stick with the torrential downpour end of the spectrum. I waited more than walked through the wall of water to the restaurant where I warmed myself with a hot cup of Nescafe. With Virgo efficiency and hopeless optimism, I was at the dock at 7.58 a.m. 7.58 a.m. I was still there an hour later when the young radio operator opened up his little dockside store. Sizing me up for the gringo sucker that I was, he set about working his various sales pitches on me. Within 15 minutes, he had separated me from another 40 bucks of my dwindling funds, leaving me now with $65 in American greenbacks, 40 of which, forty dollars of which consisted of two ripped and therefore worthless twenty-dollar bills, and one hundred soles, thirty-three dollars. This was all the money I now had to my name. I, on the other hand, was now the proud owner of one bottle of vodka one bottle of rum, 96 double chocolate Oreos, and a flimsy little purple plastic rain poncho, my only defense against the storm. <clears throat> As I had nothing else to do with my time, I contemplated the next two months of my life. Like everything else about my trip, my plans were the result of turning my life over to spirit and Google. While studying Spanish in Guatemala in January, I had been floundering around in cyberspace where I stumbled upon the website of some ritzy gringo eco-lodge by the name of Manu Wildlife Center. The slick professional website tantalized me with videos, photos, and descriptions of its 40,000 acres of virgin tropical rainforest. The photos of the little thatched roof bungalows complete with hot water in the bathrooms <clears throat> really made my mouth water. But the crowning glory of the website was its description of the lodge's 100 foot tall canopy tower which allowed guests to climb to the top of a giant kapok tree and view the jungle the, the way it is supposed to be viewed from above, the way the macaws and monkeys view it. If I understood correctly, and it turned out that I did, this canopy platform was pretty much available to guests 
any time they wanted to use it at no extra charge. There was just one small catch. There always is. This little slice of Gringo Jungle Paradise costs $150 per day. Shit! Condé Nost Magazine, which claimed that Manu Wildlife Center, quote, offered hands down the most intense wildlife experience I've had in the Amazon, close quote, hit the nail on the head when they described the comfortable lodge as, quote, a base of choice for people willing to spend good money to be treated well, close quote. Of course, my Condé Nast taste needed to be paid for with a backpacker's bad money. How could I get around this small hurdle and get my spider monkey ass up that Kapok tree? Spirit came to my rescue by pointing out that there was one way around the exorbitant price tag. I could volunteer at the Eco Lodge. Via this route, I could get one of these little bungalows all to myself in three squares a day for $10 a day. $20 if I wanted to eat with the rich tourists instead of the staff. I don't need to tell you which option I chose. If the food was good enough for the Indian staff, it was good enough for me. So it was settled. I would be a volunteer at perhaps the single ritziest gringo eco lodge in the entire Peruvian Amazon. <clears throat> this, this spur of the moment decision did of course raise one small question. Exactly what was I going to volunteer to do? I was a 49 year old real estate agent from Texas with a degree in journalism I had not used in 20 years. What the hell did I have to offer a ritzy eco lodge in the Peruvian Amazon? I scoured the website for the flimsiest of pretexts. My only hope was to offer to teach English classes in the local village alluded to in the quote at the beginning of this chapter. The fact that I had zero experience teaching English barely entered my mind. Hell, I spoke it. What was there to know? I was familiar enough with the setup of these eco lodges from Guatemala to Costa Rica to Peru to know that usually within a five minute walk of the lodge, there would be some sort of little village of local natives that supplied the labor force that operated the hotel on a daily basis. The cooks, house cleaners, gardeners, waiters, guides, boat drivers, etc. Obviously, this was the native community the website referred to. Somewhere along the line, I got the idea that the lodge's management was ultimately going to be turned over to the Indians themselves. But in hindsight, I'm not sure where I came up with that outlandish notion. Summoning up every ounce of creative writing ability I could muster, I made a proposal to the lodge that I, in exchange for a bungalow and three meals in the staff kitchen, would teach English to the Indian staff and, I assumed, their children so they could learn how to beg for money from rich Americans without looking like beggars. I sent this proposal off into cyberspace. A week or so later, I was thrilled to receive a letter back from Manu Wildlife Center that my proposal had been accepted and they, that they looked forward to seeing me April 1st. A date later moved to May 20th as I paused for several weeks in Costa Rica to sell my truck and to volunteer at a McCall Rescue Center. In all, I corresponded in writing a half dozen times with a woman named Elizabeth. I had even spoken with Elizabeth on May 13th to confirm that was all that all was set for my arrival. She assured me it was, 
and that she looked forward to seeing me at the lodge in a few days. I was still somewhat confused about my conversation the night before with the young radio operator that my boss was in fact someone named Kurtzita Ratchetta, obviously not her real name. I asked him one more time and he confirmed that was indeed the case. Whatever. As I sat there gearing up for the challenge of doing something I was woefully unprepared to do, 9 o'clock, then 10 o'clock, then 11 o'clock came and went. I was one step away from surrendering my fate to another plate of rice and scrambled eggs in the local restaurant when my 8 o'clock boat finally chugged into view. Compared to the roofless beer boat from the day before, this sleek, freshly painted and roofed boat looked like the Queen Elizabeth. I suited up into my flimsy little plastic poncho and tossed my bag of cannonballs into the boat. I climbed in while the driver and the guide climbed out with no word of explanation about where they were going or when they would be back. This seems to be the local custom of boat captains in the Peruvian Amazon. There I sat for 30 minutes starving while they went and ate a big plate of rice and eggs. <clears throat> Hadn't I been through this movie just the day before? My two trusty companions returned picking their teeth with little wooden tick toothpicks and we set off down the river for approximately five minutes when we stopped to pick up two passengers from the airport who had the brains to take the lousy 40-minute flight from Cusco. <clears throat> of course, with the horrible weather, their plane was delayed for 90 minutes, so I got to sit there for yet another interminable wait, growing hungrier by the moment. By the time my 8 o'clock boat finally headed downstream toward the Ritzy Eco Lodge, it was almost 1.30. <clears throat> As if on cue, the sun burst out from between the storm clouds just as we set off down the river. This two-minute sun bath would be the last time I would see or feel the sun for the next 75 hours. The two passengers whose plane had just been delayed for 90 minutes by the rain asked me how the weather had been for the past few days. I regaled them with my wet rat adventure in the beer boat. They laughed, but my Peruvian guide, Miguel, shot me down with a furtive, evil eye glance. Of course, Samuel jokes about the weather, Miguel explained, setting the record straight. The rain just started an hour or so ago, but now it is sunny again. Okay, whatever you say, dude. M Miguel shot me one more shut the fuck up warning glance and changed the subject to our driver, a local Indian named Arturo. Miguel who clearly was not Indian, explained that the lodge employed the local natives to drive their boats. Arturo, it turned out, would be, with one exception, the last Indian I would see during my entire stay at my new wildlife center. No doubt because my $10 cheapskate rate did not include use of the hotel's boats. At that point, of course, I assumed that Arturo and his wife and kids would be my students. <clears throat> Arturo skillfully guided our boat through the morass of logs and other obstacles crowding the swift waters of the Rio Madre de Dios as Miguel began pointing out the various trees, birds, monkeys, etc. as we motored toward our destination. Approximately 10 minutes into our two-hour journey, the rain moved in again, and Miguel casually suggested to the two new arrivals that they may want to consider putting their rain ponchos on. 
as far as I know, they never took them off again. It was just past 3 p.m. when we finally docked at the world-famous Manu Wildlife Center, and I got my look at how the other half, that would be the half with money, meaning the gringo half, lived in the wilderness of the Peruvian Amazon. Walking up the path from the dock to Disney World in the jungle, I may as well have been in another solar system after my adventures in Pilcapatha, Atalaya, Salvacion, Itawanila, and Boca Manu. There was not an oil drum, or scrap of garbage, or mangy mutt, or squalid tin roof shack to be seen. A regular tropical garden of Eden, full of manicured lawns, flowering shrubs, butterflies, and hummingbirds greeted visitors as they entered the grounds. But nothing in this garden of delights compared to the centerpiece of Manu Wildlife Center. The positively grandiloquent lodge itself, Frank Lloyd Grandiloquent Lodge itself, Frank Lloyd Wright himself could not have come up with a grander scheme. The huge wooden structure measuring perhaps 100 feet by 40 feet reminded me more of Noah's Ark than a lodge. The towering thatched roof dwarfed any such structure I had ever witnessed in two decades of traveling in Latin America. A regular forest of palm fronds must have gone into its construction. It wasn't so much palm fronds that impressed and concerned me so much as the acres of tropical hardwood that must have gone into the roof beams, walls, and floors of the ship-sized building. The Eco Lodge was a regular celebration of tropical rainforest deforestation, or so it appeared at first glance. <clears throat> Dante, my eco-warrior friend from Cusco, had told me that the lodge had, in fact, been harvested from trees growing on the private reserve's 40,000 acres of primary forest. This opinion was flatly reputed by the, log's web, by the Lodge's website, which insisted that every stick in the place had been sustainably harvested from the myriad of logs that clogged the waters and beaches of the Rio Madre de Dios, and that none of the lumber had been cut. Who the hell knows? Whatever the truth and whatever your opinion regarding tropical hardwoods, there was no denying that the architects had achieved a true masterpiece of construction in the middle of the jungle. <clears throat> Inside, beneath the sweeping cathedral-like arch of the thatched roof, the lodge was anchored by the circular bar that was well stocked with fine liquors from all over the world, with prices to match, it goes without saying. One side of the huge open room offering views of the garden from every window was taken up by the lounge, offering guests the choice between cozy chairs surrounding low-slung wooden coffee tables or hammocks slung from the rafters. The other side of the room was arrayed with tables and chairs that could accommodate some 50 diners. It was to one of these tables that the two new arrivals and I were guided by Miguel, and it was at this table that I enjoyed the first of my many gourmet meals. I figured the lodge was going to bait me with this delicious meal for free, so I would elect to pay the 20 bucks per day that would allow me access to the tourist dining room instead of the staff kitchen, which was no doubt hidden away in the jungle from the prying eye of eco-tourists, which I later found out to be exactly the case. As I munched away on some kind of trout and garlic sauce, 
with a side of steamed asparagus and rice, I started looking around at the various staff members working the dining room, kitchen, bar, and grounds. Two puzzling things about the staff were immediately apparent to me. Virtually every worker was male and between the ages of 18 and 30. And more puzzling still, every single worker in the place was clearly not native, but Peruvian. Hmm, maybe the Indians got the week weekend off. Yeah, right, Hambone. <clears throat> Somewhere between lunch and dessert, mango cheesecake, <clears throat> We were paid a short visit by the mythical Kurtzita Ratchetta herself, and I got my first view of the person who would play such a pivotal role in my life over the next 60 or so I thought at the time days, just as the radio operator had pantomimed Kurtzita was a stout, though certainly not obese woman, who at perhaps five foot eight and 180 pounds did indeed by Peruvian standards present a rather imposing figure. Kurtzito was dressed in blue jeans, a thick vest to ward off the chilly air, and a bright red bandana to crown her mane of thick curly black hair. It wasn't her bulk or her bandana that first struck one about the big boss woman, however. It was the no-nonsense, bullshit-deflecting, authoritarian vibe that emanated from her penetrating dark eyes, which seemed to shoot right through you as if they were trying to ferret out the slightest sign that you were trying to pull some stunt over on her. Which I was, of course. Whether standing or sitting, her posture was ramrod straight with arms folded beneath her ample bosom. As her stern gaze gave me the once over, I noticed with a start that I had seen those same eyes before. But where? It took me several days to place it. They were the same eyes that burned out of the bald-headed face of Marlon Brando's characterization of the infamous Captain Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. I could not believe it. After traveling for miles into the deepest reaches of the Amazon jungle to a remote outpost hours from the nearest road, I had stumbled upon a true, real-life Captain Kurtz. Oh boy, here we go again, guys. I, uh, I really apologize for this. <clears throat> I had stumbled upon a true, real-life Captain Kurtz, and she was lording over the ritziest lives in Peru, wielding a reign of terror over her subjects so thoroughly that she didn't even need a bunch of corpses swinging from trees to drive her point home who the boss was. She was the boss, and anyone who wanted to challenge her on that would suffer the consequences, which is why nobody yours truly included, ever did. Of course, it would take me days to figure all this out about the complicated character of Kurtzita. As is true with so many of her breed, she invited newcomers into her web with a light, breezy, self-effacing sense of humor that almost masked the iron will behind those dark, penetrating eyes. So, you are the famous Queen of Manu that I have heard so much about, I joked with her in Spanglish. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the ability to speak English was not one of her many talents. She regarded me suspiciously, wondering if I was playing her, playing her or flirting with her. She decided it was the second. Queen of Manu, she laughed, more like... Bruja, witch of Manu. 
She asked me if I was enjoying my lunch. I assured her it was delicious, but I sheepishly admitted that I wasn't supposed to be eating in the dining room, but with the staff in the kitchen, per my agreement I had made with Elizabeth. Elizabeth? She almost snarled. Elizabeth is the secretary in the office in Cusco. She knows nothing about this place. Here, I am your boss, and I say you will eat here in the dining room with me. She zipped her lips, indicating this was to be our little secret, never to be shared with Elizabeth. I readily agreed. Yes! My most burning question for Kurt Zeta was where all the Indian staff members were. She stared at me uncomprehendingly as if I had just asked her where the chauffeur for my limousine was. Indians? What Indians? I would like to hire Indians to work here, but they don't want to work. They get a little food in their stomachs and all they want to do is go lie in their hammocks all day. I just about laughed and told her that was a perfect description of my own work ethic, but I hit the edit button just in time. There was just something about the way she said Indians that put me on guard, a guard that I and everyone else working at Manu Wildlife Center would keep up every time we were near Kurtzita. Lunch over with, Kurt Sita invited me to go with her on a walk to the staff housing where she was heading on some errand. I followed her beyond the manicured lawns down some muddy track, muddy track through the woods until we came to a clearing which held a big, depressing, tin-roofed structure, kitchen on the right, bedrooms on the left, a detached outhouse, and some type of machine shed that held a giant gasoline-powered generator, quiet at the time, and a bunch of wooden furniture in various phases of construction. She hastily introduced me to a dozen or so young male Peruvians with the usual Latin names that I would never be able to keep straight the whole time I was there. They were just heading off to the boat to cross the river for their daily soccer game, which is how they relax between their morning and evening workloads. So this was the local Indian village the website was referring to. Oh boy, behind the village, behind sight of the eco-tourist was the lodge's laundromat, the creek which ran through the forest. On the beach where the sheets and towels were washed were scattered empty bags of laundry detergent and bottles of bleach, both of which had obviously been washed into the creek with each rinse. Okay. We returned back to the lodge and Kurt Sita waved me in the general direction of the little bungalows, telling me to choose any of the vacant ones that I wanted. She said she would meet me for dinner at 7 p.m. and stalked off toward her office. And that was that. One hour after stepping off the boat, I was free to roam the grounds and make myself at home. I gathered up my soggy bag of cannonballs and slogged down a muddy path, instinctively heading to the very last bungalow on the very edge of the forest. I was absolutely delighted to find that the last little hut, named Boa, was the Charlie Brown Christmas tree in a forest of cutesy little tourist traps. Perhaps because it was the farthest room from the comfortable lodge, the little leprechaun house had suffered from months, if not years, of benign neglect. <clears throat> Boa's roof, though basically sound, was a little frayed and war-torn around the edges. The whole place seemed to list just the tiniest bit to the right toward the jungle. 
Opening the door, I was somehow pleased to find that the abandoned little house had been stripped of the other bungalow's cutesy little touches. The curtains had been removed, there was only one mosquito net for the two beds, and there was no mirror in the bathroom. There was, however, a note above the towel rack stating that, in an effort to be environmentally correct in all they did, the lodge kindly requested guests to use their towels more than once. The scuffed floor was covered with muddy boot prints and an old wine bottle sat in the corner. But the crowning glory of the derelict chic ambiance of my new home was a ragged rip in the screen that stretched some six feet from the ceiling to the top of the low wall facing the jungle. I figured this might be an invitation to some unwelcome insect guest during the night, but that was a small price to pay for such a gorgeous view in end-of-the-road privacy. I set about making my home for the next two months. A half hour later, I was as snug as that proverbial bug in a rug, silently gloating to myself over my latest score from the universe. All this, a hot shower, three gourmet meals per day, all for ten bucks per day. Ask, and ye shall receive. By this time, the already murky light in the rainy jungle was falling fast, so I figured I had better get fifteen minutes of exploring in under my belt. Not having any clue where I was going, I pulled on a pair of ship kickers, those ubiquitous black rubber boots that everyone in the jungle wears, and took off down the closest trail behind my house, my maiden voyage into the real rainforest, one that had never felt the insult of chainsaw or bulldozer, led me down a trail of six-inch deep black muck that soon had each foot weighing several pounds. I forded on like Indiana Jones, wondering what ancient wonder of the world would await me in the end of my trek. That question was answered in about 500 feet when I came upon a huge gasoline-powered water pump used to suck the water out of the creek to fill the tanks that were the source of our bath water. Crazy me had assumed that the tanks were filled with rainwater, as we were in an eco-lodge in the middle of a rainforest after all. Little did I realize at that moment how much I would come to despise that evil machine over the next few days. I retraced my steps back to my cabin and set off with renewed optimism in the murky gloom in search of fabled lost cities of gold. I found my fabled lost city about 500 feet the other direction from my bungalow. Unfortunately, it was the city of garbage, not gold, the place where the eco-lodge dumped and burned their daily loads of inorganic trash and big open pits on the forest floor. A lingering stench of burned plastic hung in the air of the jungle clearing. Oh well. I guess my first foray into the rainforest would have to wait until another day. Within, with an hour to kill before dinner and nothing much better to do with my time, I clomped back to the lodge. There I had the immense pleasure of making my first acquaintance with Miranda, the other volunteer at the lodge that Elizabeth had mentioned to me. All I knew about this other person was that he or she was some sort of wildlife biologist carrying out some sort of study on the local wildlife. Well, this wildlife biologist turned out to be a drop-dead gorgeous 21-year-old college student from Nova Scotia, Canada who had somehow managed to come all this way to study macaws, in other words, yet another 
parrot girl like the ones I had met in my own stint as a McCall researcher in Costa Rica just a few weeks before. Jesus, I thought to myself, if I had known 30 years ago how many beautiful young women were traveling around the world alone to study macaws deep in tropical jungles, I would have majored in macaw biology. Myself, Miranda, was every bit as sweet as she was beautiful. We struck up the usual conversation about where we were from, how we got there, how long we were planning to stay, and all that jazz. Just as she had been a mystery to me, she admitted that I was somewhat a mystery to not only her, but to the rest of the staff, particularly Kurt Sita as well. Apparently, the rumor around Manu Wildlife Center was that a, quote, young biologist from Costa Rica was coming to Manu to study the wildlife there and to teach the staff, particularly Kurt Sita, English. I laughed at this absurd rumor. Well, I hope Kurt Sita is not disappointed with who showed up, I said. She's getting a middle-aged real estate agent from Texas not a young Costa Rican biologist. Miranda could sympathize. Yeah, when I got here, they were expecting some famous biologist, she said. Instead, they got a college student working on a term paper. Though I was no doubt not the prize she had been hoping for, Miranda seemed genuinely relieved to have somebody to speak English with. Her father was Peruvian, and therefore she was fluent in Spanish, but she had been missing her mother tongue. I asked her about life at Manu Wildlife Center. She said it had its moments, but there were long gaps of downtime that could get pretty boring. She told me that she used to eat in the kitchen with the all-male kitchen staff to avoid the awkwardness of eating alone in the crowded dining room where the volunteers were forbidden to interact with the paying guest unless invited to do so, but she had been forbidden to do that by Kurt Sita, who said her presence in the kitchen was distracting to the workers. That's crazy, she said. Why would anyone think I would be distracting to anybody? Hmm, let's see. You start with a dozen or so Latin males, age 18 to 30, and you dump them out in the middle of a remote jungle where they are to live for 90 days straight with no female company. Into this bottomless and volatile pit of testosterone, you drop a gorgeous, sweet, 21-year-old gringa who is half Peruvian and fluent in Spanish to boot. You then place this object of desire into a room full of guys trying to prepare and serve dinner to a bunch of whiny gringo eco-tourists paying $150 per night for a Condé Nast level of service, and you wonder why this may prove distracting to the staff? Nope! Can't figure out one good reason for Kurt Sita's hard-hearted management decision. Our pleasant little chat was interrupted by the arrival of my second gourmet meal in less than four hours. As I had mentioned to Elizabeth that I did not eat beef, one of the main menu items served at the Rainforest Eco Lodge, I was served some sort of chicken stroganoff. Like everything else at Manu Wildlife Center, it was delicious and cooked to absolute perfection. The chatty and effusive Kurt Sita, still on honeymoon mode with me, breezed into the dining room and te took the seat next to us. With Miranda translating our roughest parts of Spanglish, Kurt Sita and I hit it off like two old friends being reunited after a long absence. 
The light conversation turned to my wild trip from Cusco to Boca Manu, and I shared the story of my favorite meal, the heaping plate of giant rat, or paca, I had enjoyed in Atalaya. This news launched Kurt Sita into a long-winded rant against the bushmeat trade, which she admonished me between bites of rainforest beef stroganoff was just not cool. She was offended by my very joking suggestion that the lodge should serve paca. As ardent defenders of the rainforest, Manu Wildlife Center would never serve food that came from the very rainforest they were protecting. As she spoke, her pile of beef stroganoff and Miranda's pile of beef stroganoff and all the tourist piles of beef stroganoff dwindled on her plate. Miraculously, I bit my tongue and did not launch into one of my famous ham bone chicken little rants, but I will take this opportunity to climb up on my soapbox and say this about the subject. <clears throat> Guys, I may be crazy, but I'm not that stupid. I know it was shitty of me to eat that plate of bush meat paca and atalaya as delicious and already dead as it may have been. Okay, I admit it. I'm guilty as sin. That said, for a rainforest eco lodge to refuse to serve bush meat to its clients, then to turn around and serve beef to its guests instead is as hypocritical as Chevron oil to claim they are good stewards of the ocean because a few fish choose to school around their offshore oil platforms and is tantamount, tantamount to nothing less than treason. Manu Wildlife Center and I am quite sure dozens of other rainforest eco lodges throughout Latin America have the golden opportunity, hell, call it what it is, a moral imperative to educate their clients about perhaps the single biggest threat to rainforest on this planet by simply choosing to refuse to serve beef. Not only should they refuse to serve it, they should actively and loudly proclaim why they refuse to serve it. There is nothing eco about an eco lodge that serves beef, period, end of story. You eat a paca out of the rainforest, you have one less paca in the rainforest. You eat a cow out of a pasture where a rainforest once stood, you have zero pacas and zero tapers and zero jaguars and zero macaws left for anyone to eat. Why is this concept so hard to understand, guys? Is it that hard to connect the beef to rainforest destruction dots? When dinner was over, I asked Kurt Sita if I could stash my passport and credit cards in her office as there was nothing remotely related to a lock on Boa's door. She invited me into her inner sanctum where I was shocked to see, but I don't know why, a TV to play DVDs only as she had not yet gotten her satellite dish a computer with printer, a shortwave radio, a stereo, and all the other accoutrements of any modern day office. The phone was wired through the internet, which was available only in her office and was kept secret from the tourists who were told no internet was available there. Damn girl, you really are the queen of this joint. I blurted out, but fortunately for me, she didn't understand a word I said. She handed me an email she had received from Elizabeth the week before, the first time she had ever heard of me. It said something to the effect of, 
a young biologist from Costa Rica will be coming to the lodge for two months to study the wildlife of the area. He has offered to give you English lessons as well. Please have him help out with the tourists while he is there. Kurt Sita studied my face as I tried to translate the nonsensical letter, looking for the slightest sign that I was trying to pull a fast one over on her. A tense moment passed between us, but she gave me the benefit of the doubt that I wasn't trying to bullshit her and bid me buenas noches. I clomped back through the mud in my five-pound mud-caked rubber boots, arriving into my little bivouac in the jungle just as the skies opened up yet again with another pounding tormenta. I spread the mosquito net over my bed, took a couple of nightcap hits of weed, and stretched out on my comfortable mattress. I had survived. I had arrived at last in the real Peruvian Amazon jungle. My life could be a hell of a lot worse than this. With that happy thought and the weeds swirling around in my brain, I let the drumming of the rain and the sound of frogs send me off to La La Land. And there you go. And that brings us to uh, the Manu Wildlife Center to be continued. Bye, guys.